Well, hey everyone, back on the bench today is the JAT prototype project amp. And I want to look at the feasibility of running it in class A mode. You might say, I'll just grab a screwdriver and crank up the bias to whatever current I need in. Hey, there we go. Well, it's not that easy. You have to make concessions. You know, is the amplifier going to be thermally stable? You might have to change a component. And there's a whole lot of other things we have to consider. And that's what we'll talk about today in the video. Before I go on with fiddling with the amplifier, I want to talk about how the various operation classes work with a solid state push pull amplifier. So I made this little diagram here showing the waveform. Up here, the positive, you can think of that as the plus rail voltage and the negative rail voltage down here. I drew a very simple output stage just showing the upper and lower output transistors of a push and pull amplifier. The idea of that is to hopefully it makes a little more sense of how I'm explaining this. So how your typical push pull amplifier works, you have your waveform here. This is the positive half of the sine wave and it's handled by the upper or the positive transistor and of course the negative side is handled by the lower or the negative side transistor. Okay so we'll start out with the push-pull amplifier dealing with class B mode. So as I said you have the signal being handled by the upper transistor this positive part of the signal but as the signal falls down to in our simple case about 0.6 volts the transistor turns off it doesn't handle the signal anymore but when it reaches negative 0.6 volts it turns on again and the negative or lower transistor is handling the bottom half or negative half of the signal well in this small region here the transistors are doing nothing they're turned off and what happens is you get kind of a notch which I drew here you get this flat area in your signal and it sounds awful it's very distorted so what can be done about that is to bias these transistors so that they're always on so instead of the lower transistor coming on at negative 0.6 volts it actually begins to handle the waveform starting in the positive side and the converse is true for the uh, positive or the upper transistor. It's handling just a bit of the negative part of the signal. So now there is no more dead zone. There's That notch is gone. And there's a smooth transition from positive to negative and negative to positive on the waveform. Well, there still can be some nonlinearity in that region. There's still could be what's called crossover distortion. But to me, it's debatable of the audibility of that. And I will talk about that at the end of the video. And now that we're running a small amount of bias, that's called class AB. Now be aware that there are some engineers that don't use the term class AB. They still call it class B, but just with some bias. Rarely you see that, but you might run into that every now and then. So, if there can be potential nonlinearity, what can we do with this crossover region? Well, we can get rid of it entirely by increasing the current higher and higher. So now that this negative side dotted line gets higher and higher, and the positive side dotted line goes lower and lower, until it fully encompasses this waveform. In other words, both these transistors now are handling the full cycle of the waveform. So that's what class A would be. There is no handing off of the waveform from transistor to transistor because they're both handling the entire waveform. Okay, so the next thing you might be wondering, well, how do you know how much current to set the amplifier up for? Well, this is where it can get interesting and you can see where the problems come in. The JAT501 or JAT501 amplifier, as I call it, runs on a nominal plus or minus 35 volt supply rail. Well, in the real world, 
the output cannot swing all the way to the rails and we're not dealing with a purely resistive load. But for this example I'll just use 35 volts and a resistive 8 ohm load. So 35 volts divided by 8 about 4.4 amps. So to be sure that the amplifier is always in class A I would have to bias it at about 4.4 amps. Well, 4.4 times 70, which is the total voltage across the rails, that's 308 watts, or about 154 watts per transistor. You know, that's already outside the transistor safe operating limits. If I show you this safe operating curve here, this is for a 2SC5200 output transistor. And 35 volts, you know, this is logarithmic, so 35 would be around this point. This comes right up to this line, the DC line. And because it is a DC bias, we have to use that line. And that's at 4. We're already beyond the safe limits of the transistor which we already calculated that's just for 8 ohms if you wanted to set this thing up for 4 ohms you'd have to double the current it's you know it's getting ridiculous isn't it with 4 ohm loads you're double that you're over 600 watts and if it's a stereo amplifier you have two channels that's 1200 watts of electricity turned into heat and that's even with the amplifier sitting idle, it's always drawing that power. So what we have to do is we need to make concessions. We cannot run this at 35 volts, plus and minus. We have to lower those rails to something more reasonable. That way we can use a more reasonable current. We'll, be, we'll still be dissipating quite a bit of power, but it's going to be a lot more reasonable. Though it's still hugely significant. Okay, so what I'll do now is point you at the scope, and I'll put the scope probe on the output of the amplifier and show you the waveform. And then I'll move the scope so I can monitor the output across each emitter resistor on the output here. That way I can show what's going on with each half of the amplifier during different parts of the signal waveform. I'm running the amplifier at low voltage because I don't have it on. It's main heat sinks just on this spreader right here 4 ohm load okay so this is the output waveform it's a nice pure sine wave we can keep that on there so now I'll move over to measuring across the emitter resistor and that's a very small voltage developed there and it looks like I'm going to have to it's kind of noisy because it's only a few millivolts. And you can see this is the negative side. And we'll move over to the positive side. And I'm going to move the trigger up there. So there you can see how it's handling it. You can see it just goes below zero. I have it on uh, DC coupling of the scope. Okay, let's see what happens when I fiddle with the bias here. See, I'm turning the bias up and now that upper transistor is handling the full waveform now. If I turn it down, turn the bias down, it's handling less and less of it. Now here's the negative side, and as I turn the bias up, you can see now it's handling the full waveform. Yeah, we went off the trigger point there, but... So you can see what's going on there. Okay, so I clamped the amplifier onto this big heat sink. Now my outputs are these little TO220s, so I can't really run this as hard as I could, because these things do get quite warm. So the supply voltage here is plus or minus 15. Bias stability is great. It actually starts just a wee bit higher, like 
1.52 and then it drops out to around here 1.49 or so so no problem with bias stability I'm just using this 4 ohm load here that I used before so I adjusted the amp so I was getting sine waves when I metered across both emitter resistors and uh, let me point you at the scope here okay here is the output waveform clipping still nice symmetrical clipping so in this configuration 30 times 1.5 amps 30 volts times 1.5 amps is 45 watts wasted or dissipated I guess you could say it's pretty much wasted and let's see how much power we're getting here so tune this right to the point of clipping that looks good 8.62 volts let me uh, punch that into the calculator 8.62 squared divided by 4 18 and a half watts and the dissipated power would be 26.5 so that's what's dissipated while we're generating that signal but that dissipation stays about the same so when the signal goes to zero the transistors take over that entire 45 watts it's kind of interesting because when I'm playing the signal at full level just before clipping the transistors are dissipating 26 and a half watts and the load is 18 and a half but now that the signal is zero the power supply is still drawing that heavy load that means the transistors are taking the entire load of 45 watts so it actually makes the transistors dissipate more heat when they're sitting idle well this big heat sink it's getting really hot I mean I can still touch it and it's facing down so we're not getting airflow you know normal convection through those fins but even so this would still get pretty hot just dissipating continuous 45 watts which it would be doing at very low power levels or just sitting idle so that's one big problem with the class A amplifier it's going to dissipate tons of heat with 8 ohm loads, you can run this amplifier, I'd say you're probably safe, around 20, plus or minus 25 volts. 4 ohm loads, forget it. One modification you might have to make to the amplifier is to adjust the resistor value because I was already at the end of travel of this potentiometer setting that current. And it does vary a little bit with supply voltage, but in the biasing network here there's this resistor which prevents you from setting the current too high you have to remember this was designed to be a class a b amplifier and you don't want to be able to set this too high or you can blow the output transistors so what you could do is change the value of this maybe make it a hundred that way you can adjust this control to get higher current in the output for class A operation. Well to summarize things here, yep you can run the JAT501 amp in class A mode. Like I say you might have to make that modification. Definitely want to use these larger TO264 transistors. These get hot. You would want to use mica insulators on them. Don't use the uh, the silicone type pad, rubber pad ones, those just don't dissipate enough heat because you got DC current flowing through these, a pretty big voltage drop, things are going to get hot. You're going to have to use a very large heat sink. Uh, even this one is marginal. If this had larger fins and it was set up vertically, yeah, I could see doing that. Like I said, you have to use a lower supply voltage. You just cannot run this thing at plus minus 35 volts. You're exceeding the transistor's limits in doing so.
so what's my personal opinion of a Class A amplifier? And to me, they're not that practical. A Class AB amp, a Class D amplifier, even sitting idle, they both draw a little bit of power. Not a whole lot. But a Class A amplifier draws horrendous amounts of power. A Class A amp with a push-pull amplifier is not as bad as those other types that use a current source in a driven element. You know, those things are horrendously inefficient. But still, we were wasting a whole lot of power just to get 18 and a half watts. I would say you can probably get around 25 watts at plus minus 25 volts with an 8 ohm load, but again we were using plus minus 15 with a 4 ohm load. Now a good class AB amplifier properly set up, crossover distortion is just not going to be noticeable. I just can't believe that anybody could hear it. You know, if you have the equipment, measure the amplifier running at say 1 watt where the crossover distortion would be prominent. If you measure, say, 0 0.001 or whatever percent total harmonic distortion, it's, you know, there's no way I think you could hear that, even if it was much higher. So to me, Class A amplifiers don't make a lot of sense. They're just not my cup of tea. Looking at them with a technical eye, I just don't see the point. But hey, whatever floats your boat, if you want to run the amp in Class A mode, you can make the concessions. Of course, you get less output power. You'll get maybe 25 watts versus 60, which you could in Class AB mode with the proper power supply voltage. But I guess that's all I have to say on this one. Thanks for watching. Okay, we'll try an experiment here. I'm sitting down in my chair. And there's a kitty down under there. And I'll just flip my seat back. And we'll just sit here and see how long it takes for the kitty to jump up here. If at all. <laughs> that was quicker than I thought. Hi, nice Stick! Hey! He's going to turn around and lay down. <laughs>